it's almost midnight on the 22nd of March 2003. Six MC-130 Combat Talon transport aircraft from the 352nd Special Operations Wing are flying at just under 500 feet above the Jordanian desert towards Iraqi airspace. Aboard are the 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the American 10th Special Forces Group who are en route to the Bashur and as Soleimaniya airfields in northern Iraq. The Green Berets, CIA operators and US Air Force Special Tactics operators of the 10th SFG will rendezvous with 7,000 Kurdish Peshmerga fighters to take part in Operation Viking Hammer, one of the largest special warfare operations in military history. A quick word on this week's sponsor, War Thunder, a free-to-play military vehicle online combat game. Play massive combined arms battles on over 100 major battlefields from the Second World War to the end of the Cold War, with over 70 million players around the world. Jump into the action in more than 2,500 accurate real-world vehicles, including tanks, aircraft, helicopters and ships from 10 playable countries. With free major updates every couple of months, there's always new maps and vehicles to enjoy. Thanks to the game's intuitive mouse aim mode, you can fly any aircraft using nothing more than mouse and keyboard. Enjoy rich PvE content including dynamic historical campaigns and solo missions. Detailed vehicles, realistic graphics and authentic sound effects place you right at the helm of the most powerful war machines of our time. Play War Thunder now for free on PC, PlayStation or Xbox by using my link in the pinned comment or video description to sign up. New players and those who haven't played in 6 months will also receive a massive bonus pack on PC or consoles that includes multiple premium vehicles, the exclusive vehicle decorator Eagle of Valor, 100,000 Silver Lions and 7 days of premium account. This is available for a limited time only, so don't miss it. Viking Hammer is part of an effort to open up a northern front against Saddam Hussein's army and draw troops away from the main invasion coming from Kuwait. Coalition war planners have anticipated the need to squeeze Saddam's regime from two sides and had been planning for the US 4th Infantry Division to invade northern Iraq from Turkey. Meanwhile, American special forces will be flown into Iraqi Kurdistan, an autonomous region controlled by anti-Saddam rebels. The most important of these are the Kurdistan Democratic Party and the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, or PUK, who have formed an alliance to topple the Iraqi dictator. To prepare for Viking Hammer, Green Berets along with other special forces have covertly infiltrated Kurdistan and made contact with the Peshmerga militia, lightly armed but highly respected Kurdish warriors. Viking Hammer's main objective is to destroy the Ansar al-Islam militant group which operates in Kurdistan. However, this mission proves more difficult than originally expected. Three weeks before the invasion, Turkey declines to join the coming war and refuses to let the 4th Infantry Division attack from Turkish territory. Furthermore, Turkey bans combat overflights by coalition aircraft, meaning the 10th SFG's commander, Colonel Charles Cleveland, must improvise. A new plan is drawn up for the insertion of Cleveland's forces. They will be flown into Kurdistan from Jordan, via a risky and circuitous route. When the flight plan is revealed to Cleveland's officers, one comments, Damn, that's an ugly baby. The name sticks, and the new route is referred to as Ugly Baby. The low-flying formation of MC-130s hug the Syrian border to avoid detection. The first minutes in Iraqi airspace are uneventful, with the special forces operators passing the time by playing with their night vision goggles. However, the journey quickly descends into chaos when Iraqi anti-aircraft gunners target the lead formation. One of the combat talons, callsign Harley 3-4, takes heavy fire, shredding through the aircraft's thin metal skin. The pilots press on, but soon the fire causes more critical damage. The number one engine catches fire, and fuel leaks are detected in both wings. Faced with losing the aircraft, Harley 3-4 diverts to Injerlik Air Base in Turkey. Miraculously, nobody aboard the combat talon is wounded, and the aircraft successfully lands, having been given permission by the Turkish government. The rest of the MC-130s encounter similar AA fire. Aboard one of the transports headed for as Soleimaniya, a veteran operator turns to his friend and says, I don't know if we are going to make it man, I don't feel good about this ride. For another 50 agonising minutes, 
The green berets are thrown around the cargo hold while the aircraft manoeuvres violently to avoid ground fire. The MC-130s also deploy chaff to prevent Iraqi radar-guided AAA from locking on. Finally, the Iraqi fire subsides and the two combat talons approach as Soleimaniya Air Base. On the ground, previously inserted Green Beret Sergeant Mark Giaconia watches the aircraft make their final approaches when, just as they are about to land, the airbase's electrical generator dies and the runway lights go dark. Despite flying nearly blind, the pilots successfully land all five MC-130s. The Special Forces operators stumble out of their damaged and leaking aircraft and kiss the ground. The improvised Ugly Baby route proves treacherous, but no Coalition lives are lost, and the bulk of the 10th SFG are now in the fight. With his forces in place, Colonel Cleveland now turns his attention to their objective, the destruction of the Ansar al-Islam group. The plan is to assault the AAI's main base of operations in the town of Sargat, outside the Kurdish city of Halabja, near the Iranian border. Altogether, over 7,000 Peshmerga from the PUK, along with 70 American Special Forces operators, will take part in the attack. The advance has been split into six colour-coded prongs, each with 900 to 1,500 Kurdish fighters and a 12-man Operational Detachment Alpha Team, or ODA. Yellow Prong is to be the main effort against the suspected chemical facility in Sargat, while Green Prong will clear the ridge north of the town. Meanwhile, Blue Prong will advance towards the village of Biara. Orange and Red Prongs will assault the southern half of the AAI zone, while the troops assigned to Black will act as a reserve. The ground assault will begin at 6am on the 28th of March. As part of the A-Day offensive on the 21st of March, the US Navy launched 64 Tomahawk missiles from the Mediterranean, pounding AAI positions to soften them up before the main attack. However, the roughly 700 AAI fighters have had a week to recover and have prepared firing positions to meet any incoming assault. Although the combined US-Kurdish forces outnumber the Iraqis 10 to 1, the attackers are taking no chances. The American Special Forces and Peshmerga must navigate difficult mountainous terrain under the watchful gaze of the enemy fighters in the hills. The Peshmerga have converted large construction dump trucks into armoured personnel carriers to serve alongside flatbed trucks carrying anti-aircraft cannons and Soviet-era Katyusha rocket launchers. Mark Giaconia is part of the main assault group with Yellow Prong and later recalls, The scene reminded me of the movie Braveheart, where the two enemies faced off before battle, and like the movie, we were just waiting for a signal to begin the charge. At exactly 6am, the Kurdish artillery opens fire, signalling the beginning of the ground offensive. The Kurdish fighters jump into pickup trucks, some mount onto horses, and advance towards the Iraqi firing lines, with what Giacona would later describe as a low and gruff war cry emanating from the masses. In an attack reminiscent of the First World War, the Peshmerga charge out of their positions towards the enemy. The mix of civilian vehicles, Peshmerga on horses, and those trailing behind on foot, cross the plain in front of them. Kurdish tactics are basically to, and I quote, look for a weak point, then bum-rush it. With speed and aggression, the Peshmerga reaches the rough terrain of the Shandahari Ridge. Green Prong now separates from the main group in order to clear the ridge of enemy fighters, while Yellow Prong, including Giaconi, attack the small village of Gulp at the entrance to the Sargat Valley. As the mass of soldiers approach the entrance to the valley, AAI fighters respond with mortar and machine gun fire, forcing the attackers to halt. The fire is heavier than expected. The enemy is ready for the assault. Giaconi and the rest of the attackers take cover while enemy fire continues to rake the valley floor. With the advance stalled, combat controllers attached to the ODA team request air support from nearby aircraft from carriers USS Harry Truman and Theodore Roosevelt. Two minutes later, a pair of Navy F-A-18 Hornets arrive on station and prepare for an attack run. The controllers relay specific coordinates to the pilots, who scream in and drop two 500-pound JDAMs on the AAI positions. The timely air support delights the Peshmerga fighters as well as the ODAs, 
who cheer wildly at the sight. The F-A-18 switch to guns and make another pass on the target area. The Hornets fire long bursts from their M61AM Vulcan guns, saturating the hillside with 20mm shells. Giacona recalled, I felt each of the hundreds of small explosions in my gut. The F-A-18s make several passes to cover Yellow Prong before AAI fire is finally silenced. Giacona and the Peshmerga continue to gulp, which is taken without further resistance at 9am. After securing the town, Red Prong breaks off from their main group and heads south to capture small villages in the Sargat Valley. As the Peshmerga and Green Berets in Yellow Prong move out from Gulp, more AAI small arms fire is directed at them from a ridgeline to the south. The Green Berets unload a Mark 19 grenade launcher from one of the trucks and begin assembling it under fire. When the Mark 19 is ready, a Green Beret sergeant launches 50 rounds at the AAI position, saturating the ridgeline with 40mm grenades. Several AAI fighters attempt to retreat, but many are cut down by the fearsome Mark 19. Once again, the Iraqi fire subsides, with the defenders either dead or disappeared into the hills. With the path clear again, the ODAs pick up the Mark 19 and toss it in the back of the pickup truck before remounting the vehicle. The column moves out without coming under fire. At the same time, red and green prongs have successfully routed the AAI fighters, forcing them to flee from their defensive positions. The fast pace of the Kurdish advance has left the Iraqi fighters unable to depress their mortars and heavy machine guns fast enough to engage the attackers. However, the retreating AAI insurgents are now being funneled into Sargat, where they intend to make a last stand. After a brief rest, Yellow Prong is ready to assault Sargat. The suspected chemical facility is located at the base of a hill overlooking the southern part of the town. As the joint Kurdish-American force reaches the outskirts, the rough terrain suddenly gives way to open ground. Located at the bottom of a large valley, Sargat is essentially a giant kill zone surrounded on all sides by rugged hills perfect for defence. AAI fighters immediately open fire from prepared positions, pinning down the attackers. Captain Blake Rainier loses reliable radio contact in the deep valley and is unable to call for counter-battery fire from the Peshmerga. The commander of C Company radios in requesting a sitrep, but is told, Sir, I'll have to call you back, we're a little busy here right now. The Peshmerga and US operators begin receiving accurate mortar and World War II era Katyusha fire forcing them to take refuge in a graveyard. AAI fighters have mounted Katyusha rocket pods on fixed positions and are bombarding the advancing forces. Ignoring the grim irony of taking cover in a graveyard during a firefight, Captain Rainier realises that he can't risk calling in an airstrike with his spotty radio comms. He decides they have no choice but to fight their way through the town. The captain orders Sergeant Giacona and two other Green Berets to set up an M2 50 caliber machine gun. The three men brave the intense firefight around them and retrieve the 50 cal from a pickup truck in the rear, before climbing high ground to prepare a firing position. After deploying, the 50 cal opens up to provide cover fire for the pinned down men, allowing them to move forward into Sargat. A weapons sergeant from Green Prong also begins targeting enemy fighters with his 50 caliber sniper rifle, focusing on the machine gun crews firing from caves and trenches on the ridgeline. The momentum shifts when Kurdish artillery is finally brought up and begins knocking out AAI positions one by one. In fact, the Peshmerga's rapid charge up the valley has completely wrecked the enemy's defensive preparations. Due to the speed of the advance, AAI fighters have been unable to fall back to prepared positions where they could take advantage of pre-stocked weapons and ammunition. Most of them are quickly overrun or flee to the east. After three hours, Sargat is secured and the American operators receive a pleasant surprise. Despite the delay in bringing up artillery support, the Peshmerga's food truck is right on time and arrives at 1pm to serve hot kebabs and, with the presumed great envy of the Republican Guard Division's way to the south, healthy lashings of onions. As part of the plan, 
The Kurds turn the town over to the American Special Forces, who immediately secure the suspected chemical weapons plant. A Sensitive Site Exploitation, or SSE, team is called in to inspect the Sargat facility, which has the potential of proving Saddam Hussein has been connected to militant groups seeking WMDs. However, the SSE squad only finds insignificant traces of ricin and potassium chloride. Further investigations confirm the facility contains no chemical weapons. After lunch, the battle continues as the Peshmerga pursue the remaining AAI insurgents deep into the mountains near the Iranian border. The offensive has made progress everywhere on the first day. To the south, the Blue Prong achieves their objective in capturing the town of Biara, while red and green prongs clear the hills overlooking the maze of valleys. Only the orange prong to the north has been seriously impeded by enemy resistance, forcing the Peshmerga and ODAs to halt short of a bunker complex on Hill 1351. The advance is finally stopped at nightfall, and four AC-130 gunships take station to suppress the enemy fighters. In the following days, many insurgents will attempt to cross into Iran, only to be arrested by the border guards. In some cases, the AAI fighters are fired upon by border guards, which force them back towards the Peshmerga. The following day, airstrikes and reinforcements from the Black Prong are enough to push the AAI forces off Hill 1351. By the 30th of March, the area has been secured by the coalition. Operation Viking Hammer is a success, with most of its objectives completed on the first day. Ansar al-Islam effectively ceases to exist after suffering 200 killed and wounded with the rest fleeing into the mountains or taken prisoner. Many of the survivors find refuge in Iran where they are harboured by the hostile anti-West government. Only three Peshmerga are killed and 23 wounded with no American casualties. The commander of 3rd Battalion of the 10th SFG, Lt. Col. Ken Tovo, will later comment that Viking Hammer was my most professionally satisfying mission. The Peshmerga forces involved in the operation have performed exceptionally well, and Mark Giacona later writes, The Kurds have spent generations in war. They had it down to a science. The PUK quickly consolidates their hold on the region now that AAI has been dealt with, leaving 1,000 men to patrol the area and root out remaining enemy positions. The rest of the approximately 7,000 Peshmerga are redeployed to the south for the next phase of Operation Iraqi Freedom's Northern Front Offensive. Play War Thunder now for free on PC, PlayStation or Xbox by using my link in the pinned comment or video description to sign up. New players and those who haven't played in 6 months will also receive a massive bonus pack on PC or consoles. This is available for a limited time only, so don't miss it.